Um, my name is Marilyn Ablon. I'm the principal of Donaldson Way Elementary School in American Canyon. And it is a truly a wonderful honor to be a part of this event. And I'd like to introduce you to May Respicio. She is a Filipina American author here to join us tonight to talk to you about her wonderful book. So welcome, welcome May. Thank you so much. It's so wonderful to be here. Um, I wish I could see you all and be there in person, but I'm so happy that we can connect this way, even during these you know, times when we're all still a little bit stuck at home, right? So, hi. Hi, I am excited. So, as we begin our, our book chat and learning more about you, tell us about your journey as an author. Like, how did you evolve and become this author? Sure. Well, you know, before I launch in, I'd like to quickly just say, um, especially for you kids watching at home. So one of the things I've loved doing for so long now is going to bookstores such as Copperfields or to my library to listen to authors and artists speak. And so something I've been doing for a very long time um, is I have a notebook and this one is very appropriate. It says, dream, believe, achieve. And whenever something strikes me that's interesting or inspiring, or maybe I wanna look it up later, I write it in the same notebook. I've had this one for many years. And when I need some motivation or a tip or something to write about, I just flip through this. So tonight, if it's easy for you, um, you know, grab a piece of paper and write down anything that you feel is sort of interesting, something that you might wanna go back to later. And then also at the very end, we're gonna have a chance for some questions and answers, which is really cool. So if you can write them you know, on your paper and a notebook or even just keep them up here and we'll have a little Q and A session at the end. So I just wanted to mention that because it's a, it's a great habit to get into and I've been doing that for a very, very long time. Um, so yes, my name is May Respicio. I'm, I'm so honored to be here. I also live in the North Bay, so I'm not too far from you all. Um, I have two sons. Uh, one is in middle school in seventh grade and one is in fifth grade. And I think I'll, I'll start a little bit by telling you about my book, um, just in a nutshell, and then let's talk about my author journey. And maybe you'll have some questions um, in the end about books and how they're made and how one becomes a writer. So these are my books. This is um, The House That Lou Built. And this is all about a 12-year-old girl named Lou whose big dream is to build a tiny house, all 100 square feet of it on her own. And so this is a fun one, especially for folks in the Bay Area, because um, it's set. So the setting, you know, where a book takes place, m uh, all the setting is in the Bay Area. It's in San Francisco, Daly City, Marin. Um, so you might recognize a lot of landmarks and a lot of things that Lou sees during her adventures in trying to build a tiny house. Um, so that's um, this book. And then this book that came out um, during the peak of the pandemic is called Any Day With You. And this is probably the one that we'll, we'll touch on tonight. Um, and let me just uh, tell you about this in a nutshell. So this is all about a 12-year-old girl named Kaya. Um, Kaya, her, her, her name means sea in Hawaiian. So sea as in the ocean. Um, and the when I'm searching for characters' names, I always try to put in names that have meaning to the themes of my book. And this book is set largely by the ocean and on the beach. So her name is Kaya. Kaya has a very special person in her life and he is um, her 90 year old great grandpa and they call him Tatang. Tatang is a Filipino word for grandfather. I've called many um, loving people in my life Tatang. And so what happens with these two is that one summer Kaya's um, whole life changes. It's turned upside down because Tatang makes the announcement that he is going to return to his homeland of the Philippines. Um, he's lived with Kaya her whole life he is one of the most beloved people to her and she doesn't want him to go. So it's this sudden change in her life. And so what Kaya does, um, she decides that she's going to convince Tatang to stay put. She doesn't want him to go. So she and her friends make a movie that they enter into a contest. And the movie is all about the Bakunawa 
Um, the Bakanawa is a Filipino um, sea creature from, from a mythical sea creature. The story behind the Bakanawa is he eats all of the suns and the moons, and that's what causes an eclipse. So she and her friends make a movie about um, all of the folklore and the folk tales that Datung loves to tell her. And I think that if they win, that that's going to um, keep him from saying goodbye. So those are those are my books in a nutshell. And if it's okay, can I share a little bit more about my writer's journey and how I got to Absolutely. Publish? We want to hear it. I'm getting excited just oh, hearing good. about the stories. And I, and I love how you're using the language. The audience loves that. Yes, please tell us more about your author's journey. Well, we'll talk about the folklore too, because folklore was a big part of my life and my journey just growing up and becoming becoming a human in this world was hearing my family's stories and hearing their tales. And, and that, that's part of this. So we'll talk about that. But, you know, like Mrs. Jennings said, she's a huge reader. Um, I was I was a reader before I was a writer. So, you know, do me a favor, if, if you're sitting with someone at home and you love to read, just turn to that person and give them a thumbs up. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you guys thumbs up because I love to read. And that's how I started. My love of words was reading. Um, I'm gonna show you a few books. These were actually my books when I was growing up as a kid in the eighties. Beverly Cleary, do you like this cover? Isn't that a very 80s cover? And did you know that Beverly Cleary, and, and I'm sure many of you have read Ramona Quimby, she turned 104 years old this year. Can you believe that? I wanna be 104 and still reading and writing. Um, I loved Beverly Cleary's books, Runaway Ralph. I loved, loved Judy Bloom. I read all of her books, I still read them. Um, those were some of my favorites. Uh, oh, oh, here's a good one, A Wrinkle in Time. This is one of the first books I remember being immersed in a whole different world. I used to get really creeped out by this cover. <laughs> um, so I started off as a reader and reading was important to me. Um, a little bit about my family's story and my story is my family is from the Philippines. I'm sure some of you might be as well. Um, I was the first person in my family to be born in the United States, the first generation of my family. Um, so the Philippines, for those of you who don't know, um, is an archipelago, which is basically a, a group of islands. And the Philippines has literally thousands of islands, I think over 7,000 islands. Um, and for my parents growing up in a you know rural countryside of the Philippines, they grew up in the Lo Ilocos region, sort of the northwestern um, coast of the Philippines, um, books and school and education were always their way to a better, richer life. And so for me, you know, they always stress the importance of books and reading. And so my, my parents are huge readers. My mom is a retired elementary school teacher. You know, she taught ESL, she taught second and third grade. She was the person who instilled a love of reading in me. And I'm a writer because I'm a reader first. Um, and then I'll tell you the moment when I became or when I thought I wanted to be a writer is I was in the third grade um, and I entered a district-wide poetry contest and I won. <laughs> I won this contest. And, you know, it was the first time that I realized that I could express myself through the words that I love so much. And, and I could share those words with people. People could read my words, they could react to them. Um, and, and from there, it was just, you know, something went off in my head and really writing, for those of you who love to read and write or books, it can be a life calling. You can you can work with books, you can work with words. And so from there, um, I, I do remember I joined, uh, we had a creative writing club at my school, I joined that. Um, and I was just always reading, always writing. And here's a wonderful, easy secret, is that writing is like a muscle. So the more you do it, what happens with your muscles, the more you do it, the stronger you get. So from that point on, when I was, you know, uh, uh, and you know what, I actually have a picture of me around that age. There I am in my Olin Mills picture with all the books. <laughs> um, and so I just kept on doing it and doing it. It's like a muscle. And I do that every single day. There's a huge chunk of my day 
that goes into reading and writing and playing with words. And the more you do it, the easier it gets, the stronger, the stronger you get as a writer. And so from there, um, you know, I always just knew I wanted to be a writer. I went to college, I studied journalism, I studied print journalism and broadcast journalism. And I worked as a writer um, in the news for a while. I worked for a station up in Sacramento. I worked um, as an on-air promotions writer uh, for NBC and Burbank in Los Angeles, where I lived for, you know, 15, 16 years. Um, I did lots of different kinds of writing over the past couple of decades. I was, I've been a copywriter. I've worked um, for UCLA. I've, I've written for print magazines. I've, I've done all kinds of writing. So definitely writing can be a life's calling. It can be something that you do on a daily basis. Every industry needs writers. Um, and so as far as books, my journey to writing these books, let me ask you something. When you look at, when you look at this kid, but you look at these covers, look at my face and look at, what do you notice? I mean, I love these books. These are such beloved books and they will always have special meaning to me. But every book I read as a kid growing up in the 1980s, none of them had a single kid on the cover who looked like me or who looked like my family. Um, there, there was never any mention of, you know, Filipino American families or, or any of what I knew to be my everyday life in any of what I read. And so when I became, when I grew up and when I became an adult, um, for a while my job was I, I oversaw or I managed a writing program at UCLA. And um, I met a colleague there who became a friend. And she, when we hired her to teach writing classes for our program, she you know, gave us many of her books to put in our library in the office. And one of them just struck me because it was the first time I'd ever seen a girl who looked somewhat like me. And it was this book, Millicent Min, Girl Genius by Lisa Yi. And I was already a grown up at that time. You know, I was probably in my 20s. So can you imagine being a reader your whole life and you don't see any kid or recognize any family who kind of, you know, feels familiar to you until you're a grown up? Um, and that really was the reason I started writing books for kids. And actually, I heard um, your talk with Aida Salazar, and it sounds like she had a little bit of a similar story. And, and you know, when my kids were born, and again, they're now 13 and 10, I thought, you know what, I'm going to start building their library at home. And I was looking in bookstores online, and there really wasn't anything at that time. And this is not that long ago, you know, a decade ago that I could find any um, Filipino American kids as, as a protagonist in a book. And so that's when I decided to write my own. And there's a wonderful quote um, by Beverly Cleary. I'm just gonna read it because I wrote it down. Um, and this really inspired me. It's she, Beverly Cleary, who wrote Ramona Quimby and many other of my favorite books said, if you don't see the book you want on the shelf, write it. And that's really powerful. That's what I did. So, you know, you can write about anything. You can write about your family. You can write about what's important to you, the things that are you're curious about. Um, but it's a powerful thing to know that if you don't have the kind of book that you want, you can write it. And that's exactly what I did. And so it's been a really, you know, it's been an awesome journey to go from different types of writing to finally, you know, really finding my voice in writing books for kids. And so that's how I came to write books about um large, loving, loud Filipino American families. <laughs> May, I love how you encompassed everything that was on my mind and you conveyed oh, to our audience as well about your journey about becoming a writer. And then also reminding our audience too that the Philippines is an archipelago to, you know, many, many thousands of islands and just connecting. And I do know in many cultures, particularly ours, folklore, folk tales is many ways that our families teach us about our culture back home. Because like you, I'm, you know, first born here in the United States, Filipino American. And that was like my connectivity before even having an opportunity to travel to the Philippines. Um, I love that quote that you said about Beverly Cleary. Would you mind repeating it one more time so our audience can hear that one. Let me find my is, is, Okay, Beverly that, Curry, a what? she's 104 this year. She said, if you don't see the book you want on the shelf, write it. It's 
Can I just say how that resonates with me and just the young people in our audience right now? Because I know our, 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 our students have so many stories. They have stories and they're hearing stories and how do they take that and cultivate it and then translate so everybody can share. Um, May, can I ask you for our, our students um, that are listening, how many revisions did you have to do? Because, you know, your two books just didn't <laughs> emerge just like that. I, I can only imagine that like, you had these wonderful stories, these wonderful tales, this beloved relationship that I know you have with your family members and then take it and then make it into a book. Like how many edits, how many versions is that? Well, you know, so if it's okay, I'll just share a little bit about the actual writing process of a book. Um, sure. and, and, and one thing I want to stress is that every writer has a different process for writing her books or, or their books. Um, there's no, I, I have many, I'm lucky to have many author friends. And whenever we talk about our process, you know, process is how you do something, how you, you get through your journey. Um, it's always different. So this is just mine. And, and when you write your own things, you might have a different process as well. Um, I always start off by brainstorming. And actually, I have an, uh, an example of that. So, you know, another thing I do, I keep a notepad everywhere. I have one in my car, in my backpack, in my purse, on my desk, in the kitchen, by my bedside. <laughs> That's already six. Because you never know when ideas are going to strike. And for me, I'm not very good at holding things in my head. You know, they'll just kind of go out the other. And I have to write things down. So I, I always jot down what I observe. And a lot of times my book ideas start with a really simple question, what if? You know, um, what if you woke up one day and you discovered you were a wizard? You know, what if? And so, so I tend to take that question and, and brainstorm it. And so this is just an example of one of my notebooks. I have literally probably hundreds of these that I've had over the past couple of days. So this um, recently, I've been trying to think of a story uh, that's set with a, an earthquake that happens. And so I have up here, it says details. It says world turned to jello or um, forever passed by in 15 seconds. So, you know, I spent a lot of time just jotting down things that come to mind, you know, a lot of times they're not going to make sense here, but you can go back and dig through and find little nuggets that you can expand on. It's really just about getting inspired and, and figuring out what you're curious about, because you know what, when you're writing a book, you're going to spend a lot of time writing this book. This, this one, The House That Lou Built, probably took me on my own um, just a little bit each day, maybe about a year and a half. That's a long wow. time to spend with an idea. Mm -hmm. Um, any day with you was shorter. This one was about four months, but you want to be curious about what you're writing about because you're going to spend a lot of time with that idea. Um, you know, I do a lot of you, you might do this in, in classes, in your ELA classes. I do a lot of uh, word clouds and word bubbles. Like I started with a boy and then, you know, well, who is that boy? Where does he live? What does he look like? What does he want in this world? I ask all those questions. So I spent a lot of time thinking up questions that I'm curious about. Um, sometimes I do this, I do this on my computer. I sort of take, you know, pictures or, or colors and I try to set a mood. I like this mood because it feels very soft and very lovely. I don't know what I'm gonna use it for yet, but I spend a lot of time even just visually trying to understand what my story is gonna be about. So once I finally have an idea, you know, what if, so my next book that comes out, it's not gonna be out until fall of 2021, but it's all about two kids who start a slime war at their school. And the deeper, the deeper story is a boy and his father and they both have different expectations of each other. So that book, you know, what if a kid started a slime war at his school? So once I have that idea, um, what I do, let me, let me show you this really quick, is I, I need a roadmap. And again, many writers are different, but for me, I need an outline. And you, I know you all learn this in your ELA classes or your writing classes. So this is mine. This is what I actually use for how to win a slime war. Oh, you got act one, act two, act three, beginning, middle, end, beginning, middle, conclusion. Everything you write, essays, narrative pieces, books, a little paragraph um, that you're writing for your teacher, you're gonna have a beginning, a middle, and an end. So this is how I start. You know, literally, I just put them on post-its. Each post-it for me represents 
a beat or a scene or a chapter. And what it allows me to do is, is I'm a very visual learner. So I can see the arc of the journey of my main character and I can move these around. If I'm done with a scene, I can be like, oh, I wrote it, I can get rid of that. <laughs> So this is how I start most of my books. And oftentimes it will change as I get to know my characters. And you know, this is just one of the, your science, science um, show boards that I got at Target. So you can do it on a wall, you can do it in paper. That's, that's my process for writing books. And then, so what happens from there, you know, I have my story beginning, middle, end. I write it. It takes however long it, it takes um, for how to win a slime war. It took me about four or five months to have a very, very messy draft. Um, and then, so those of you listening at home, what do you think comes next? Mrs. Avalon or Mrs. Jennings, what do you think happens after you spend four months or a couple of years writing your draft? You have to revise it and then edit. Revise, okay. revise, 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 revise again. Revise, revise, revise. So I don't know any, writer who just writes something and then they just whip it off and it's done. Uh, so just like when you're in school, when you're writing something for class, you know, you want to read it, you want to make sure it's the best it can be. And so for me, this is what it looks like. Let me show you. And actually I have more. This is just like half of it, <laughs> but you ready? I'm ready. Whoa. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Seriously, wow. only about half because I already recycled the other half because we, we just have so much paper in our house. But this was for how to win a slime war. Um, these are all my own notes. It looks messy, but that's my own process is I'm pretty messy when I'm revising. Um, so let's see. May, I, I wanted to tell you, you just validated all of our teachers right now. You validated our teachers about the importance of graphic organizers and charts and having the details and having a sequence of events and reminding our students too, it's more than just one revision, it's multiple. And I wanna add feedback because you're as a writer, as a storyteller, you're always gonna get really good feedback from your teacher or another peer or another adult. Oh, definitely. Thank you for doing all of that. Feedback is so important. And you know, one thing I love to do, this is another fun tip and maybe you probably learned this in your classes, but I, I, still, um, well, for me, I print out every draft, but I read every draft aloud because when you're reading, and I do this for everything. I do this for emails. I do this for um, my web writing work. I also do, I work for a tech company doing web writing because you hear things differently when you read it aloud. You, something might sound a little clunky or something you might stumble on a word and you think, okay, there's something about that that I, that I need to revise because you hear it a little bit differently with your ear, right? So I, I always read things aloud and then I take the time you know, to mark it up like all my X's there. Um, and then, so when it comes to publishing a book, when you're working with a publisher the way I do, once uh, an author, and this is sort of the same for, for all authors, once an author is done with your own draft and you've gotten it as strong as you can, you've revised it, you've read it aloud, you've take, you know, you've done spell check, you, you've done all those things, um, then you send it to your editor. And typically, um, so the way I think of an editor is an editor is like your teacher. Uh, my editor is helping me make, is helping me to write the best work that I can write. You know, it's we learn from each other, just like you would with your teacher. We give suggestions. She gives me lots of questions to think about. Um, and so most editors write what they call an editorial letter. And it's basically um, they tell you and this is what this is an example. They tell you what was work. Well, for me, they told me what was working in my book and what they thought was not working. And that's mainly this stuff that I marked up. You know, the, all the highlights, those were the things that I, that resonated with me about my editor's notes and that I had to figure out how to incorporate those into, into this. And so I'm going to show you, so for my first book, my, my first book was a, The House That Lou Built was really a learning process for me because I'd never um, quite done this before. I'd taken many classes in learning how to write. Um, but this was really the first thing that I'd finished from start to finish. You know, sometimes it's hard to write a book. You, you write it and you put it down and you never finish. So I had a lot of editorial letters and I taped them together. You ready? 
Okay. We're ready. I think this is. Okay, these are all my, so my editor, her name is Wendy Lamb and she's published um, The Watsons Go to Birmingham. She published um, When You Reach Me. She, she's done so much in her career and I was lucky to work with her or lucky to work with her now. And these are all her edit letters. It just keeps going and going. This is like the longest list ever, right? And so, you know, let me tell you what, she, look, it's still going. And all the scribble scrabbles and highlights, those are my notes of like, oh my gosh, I have to actually revise my book after I spent a year and a half writing it. I still have to revise it. So, you know, a lot of her, her notes and a lot of the things that authors do when they're revising are the same things you're doing in your wonderful classes with your wonderful teachers. Um, you know, she talks about showing, not telling. You know, it's more interesting if you show something happening rather than just sort of describing, you know, what happened. Um, we talk about details. What are the details that will make my setting richer or that will make my characters grow or that sound really interesting? Um, so all the things you guys and all the things you're learning in school, you know, that this is what you'll be putting into practice if you write a book. So it, it all goes toward, toward the process. And look, it keeps going and going. That's, That's really, really Thank you. <laughs> That's really remarkable. And it's just fascinating to hear about your writing, your writing process and sort of the journey from an idea in your head to it being on paper to it actually being a book. It's quite a long process. And so I really appreciate you sharing that um, with um, the, um, all the people who are here. I had a question. I know that the book, the Any Day Now book, there's the um, the grant, the great grandfather in that story has lots of sage advice and good questions that he asks Kaya. And one of the things he says, or he asked her is like, where are your feet at? And I think it came at a point that was, um, you know, so can you talk a little bit about maybe some, did, was your, did your great grandfather use that expression? Is this something that you've heard before? Um, I just found it a, just a, a really unique and uh, poignant um, uh, uh, quote. Well, thank you. And, and I appreciate that, uh, that comment and it's probably my favorite line in the book so it's nothing that we that I that came from my actual life um, but the concept comes from my life and so oh here we go um, Kaya is a kid sometimes she gets worries in her head like we all do you know she has this sudden change in her life and she, and she gets a little concerned about it um, you know, th this has sort of happened to all of us in the past several months, right? A lot of changes. And so the thing that Datang does to sort of get her out of her head and into the present moment is he said, he says, where are your feet? Kaya, where are your feet? Um, and it's just a little mindful way of, of being in the present so that you can focus on what is at hand and you can focus on the moment. And, and that really, um, I love that line and it speaks so much to what this book is about, about change and resiliency. And an, uh, a fun thing, um, actually under the book jacket, so sometimes editors or publishers um, will put a little imprint on the book cover as sort of a nod to the story or as a little fun gift to the author after working with the author for so long. And um, on Any Day With You, they actually put footprints which was really fun. And, and I didn't know that they were gonna do that. So that was a nice surprise. But um, this book was very loosely inspired by my grandfathers. So I actually have some pictures of them. Um, so, you know, Tatang decides to return to his homeland of the Philippines. And it's, it's something that my, one of my grandfathers did. This is my maternal grandfather. And he decided, you know, he lived here for, you know, I don't know, three decades. He was an American citizen. When he first came here, he worked out in the asparagus fields, picking asparagus. He, he had a tough life and a tough journey. And, and he decided at some point in his life, he wanted to go home to his home country. So, you know, it brought up a lot of questions for this book. Where is your heart? Where is your home? Is your home where you live? Is your home where your heart is? Is your home a feeling? Is your home the people? you know, around it, inside of it. Um, so it th was sort of very loosely inspired by that. I wanted to see what it would mean for a kid if 
the thing that she, the, the person she's loved her whole life decides to suddenly go, go home, you know, and in, in, you know, Mrs. Avalon, you can probably relate to this in our, in the Filipino culture. That's a, it's a very common thing. People go home to the Philippines. Um, and then my other grandfather, so my aunt wrote this book, my auntie wrote this book. Um, this is my grandfather, my paternal side. And he was a prisoner of war in World War II. He was in the Bataan Death March. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a very loose storyline where Tatang um, was also in the war. And he also marched in the Bataan Death March, which was, um, gosh, I don't know how many miles, like 60 miles, 66 miles. He was a survivor. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, if you think about that's probably from, um, you know, Napa to a little bit past San Francisco, right? About 60 miles. Imagine doing that march with no food, no water, no friends, no family. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's what my grandfather did. And he survived that. So I, I definitely pull from my own life um, in the stories that I write. You know, I write about what I'm curious about, but I also try to dig deep and I write about what I know. And when you write about what you know, deep inside you, those are the things that, those are the details that make a story so rich and so uniquely you, um, is to write about what you know. So I try to put a little bit of all of that into, into what I write. And so this book, Any Day With You, I really also wanted to touch on, um, you know, how do our family's histories take root? You know, how, Kaya is always hearing stories from her, her tatang about the Philippines, about growing up there, about folklore. You know, what does that mean for her and her lens of the world? How does that, that shade how she goes through her world and makes choices and grows and and becomes you know a, a wonderful human being how do those things help her along the way so definitely um you know all of this of uh, my family's history i always try to put into what i write and so when you're writing you know think about those things you know interview your your family members and ask them about what their past was because you know your mom or your dad or your guardian has a, had a past before mm -hmm. you were born and a lot of times it's really interesting and and those are the details that can really um liven up or enrich your stories thank you i mean i think that there's so much truth in writing about what you know and that everyone has a story to tell Mm -hmm. And I'm so curious. We have some um, some people that have raised their hand um, who want to ask some questions. So um, we'll take a few questions. And uh, 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 Mr. Ruiz, uh, I see the first one is Maribel uh, Bravo. And um, uh, Maribel, if you want to ask your question um, to um, to May Respicio, do you have a question? I think you have to unmute. Is she unmuted? Miss Ruiz? She is. Miss Honor Jenny. Okay. She has to unmute herself, I think. Maribel? Okay, we'll come back to you, Maribel. Okay, I'm not sure. Um, um, the next person whose hand is up is Rodolfo Calderon. For, uh, uh, Paramo? Paramo? Rodolfo's, Rodolfo's running the older version of um, Zoom, Ms. Andre Jennings, so I won't be able to unmute, un unmute his mic. So if you, Rodolfo, if you could just up, update your uh, version of Zoom, you will be able to, to ask your question, okay? Um, the, next, <laughs> the next person is Bridget, and if anyone else has questions, please make sure to raise your hand. Um, Bridget, do you have a question? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, Bridget. Uh, hi, Bridget. Hi. I just wanted to say that I'm so thankful for your um, book. Um, I When I read The House That Lou Built in the Spring, I got so excited because I was like, oh my goodness, this is reflecting my students. And I was so excited to read to them. We're reading it now. And to see them get excited about seeing the Filipino culture, seeing the mixed race culture, seeing the Bay Area culture has been amazing. And um, they designed their own tiny houses. And it's been the most engaged they've been 
all year <laughs> during Zoom. So I really appreciate that um, inspiration for them and um, writing books that reflect my students. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Those are such kind words and I appreciate that. I appreciate you sharing the story with your students. And you know what, I actually I have um, an activities guide that I will forward to uh, Mrs. Jennings and to Mrs. Avalon and, and they can share it with the teachers, whoever wants to look at it. Um, it just has some activities and some things that tie into the book that you can use in your classrooms if you wish to. So, but thank you. I really appreciate those kind words. That'd be amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bridget. Um, do we have any other questions? I'll, um, you just hit the raise your hand button and um, you'll be able to um, uh, ask questions. And I see we have um, Norma Ortiz. So Norma, what uh, question do you have for, um, for May tonight? Oh, can you hear me? Okay, yes. thank you. Um, hi, Ms. Um, Jennings. And um, I appreciate that um, you guys are taking the time to do these events, inviting authors, that's very enriching and informative for our students and even for parents. Um, I'm discussing, well, we were having a chat here with um, my daughter and self. We were just curious. Um, do you, do you, for instance, um, like um, for the publishing aspect, do you have one uh, publisher or do you um, have more than one and can it get a little bit pricey because I saw like that that's amazing you had like a big roll of papers and all of that that's great so we're curious to know um, how do you what do you do or how do you go out there looking for um, a publisher like what do you what qualities do you see in in in, in that publishing um, that person or um, I don't know, business. Yeah, but... that's a great question. And you know what I'll do? So I, I'm just writing this down so I don't forget is um, I'll give you, I in addition to the activities guide, I'll forward maybe a list of resources in case some of your students or kids um, might be interested in trying to figure out how to publish their own work. And, and there's lots of contests are great ways for students to get started in having a taste of having an audience. Um, so there are really two kinds of publishing. There's traditional publishing and then there's self-publishing. Both are wonderful and um, they are very different. So uh, in traditional publishing, which is what I do, um, typically an author has an agent. And um, so, you know, you if you're not, if you don't have a publisher that you yet work with, your agent will shop around your story to all the publishers and, and she'll say, or he'll say, you know, hey, I have this writer, her name is May, and she wrote this book about um, this girl whose grandfather is going home to the Philippines, would you like to buy it? And so it's definitely, it's a, it's a business from there of, um, you know, there's so many decisions involved in whether a publisher picks up a book. And so I have one publisher, which is Random House, and they are so far publishing everything that I'm writing. Um, and, but there's, there's so many decisions that go into it, what they think can sell, what they, what kind of stories they need, what kind of stories they don't have, you know, what has done well in the past. So at that point, when an agent goes out to a publisher, this, the author is sort of out of it because they look at numbers, they look at statistics, they look at um, how much money they think that your book can bring to them. So, it, you know, it's a little bit harrowing of a process sometimes, but um, that it was a process that I, that was the route that I choose, chose to take with my books. Um, and then I do have a lot of author friends who also self-publish their work. And that I don't know much about, but you know, there are reputable companies out there where you can pay them a fee and then they will help you, um, you know, from start to finish, they, they offer different services like editing or designing a book cover and, and just printing it so that you can um, actually go out there and, and sell it or find bookstores um, who will help you sell your book or libraries who will carry it. So they're, they're two very different um, avenues. And for me, you know, working with a traditional publisher has been very rewarding because um, it's a big team. So for this uh, book cover, uh, the artist, she lives in Colombia. 
you know, imagine getting the chance to work with an artist who doesn't, you know, is not local to you, which is pretty cool. Um, or, you know, my, my editor lives in New York and we have a really wonderful relationship where we're always calling or emailing. So I, I love that aspect of traditional publishing that I can work with a team of creative people who love books just as much as I do. Um, and as far as kids, if you know, if you're interested in publishing your work, um, if you could get a grown up to help you look for a writing contest online, you know, that's really the way I started. And, you know, mine was at my school, but there's lots of writing contests um, through magazines like Highlights, um, lots of kids magazines, lots of organizations. Um, when I was living in Los Angeles, there was a place called Write Girl. Um, you know, they, they offered writing contests. So it's just a great way to get your feet wet, to have other people read your work and to sort of begin the process of learning what it means to put something out into the world. So, um, you know, I'm gonna, I have my to-do list here. I will send some resources along for any teachers or parents who might be interested in that. Thank you. Um, you know, we have some questions that people submitted ahead of time. And so I wanted to see one of them is, um, are there um, Asian Americans or specifically Filipino Americans who inspired you when you were growing up? Oh, when I was growing up, you know, uh, as far as writers, there were not as a, when I was a kid, because, you know, again, there weren't really many books, but the people who inspired me were the women in my family, the really strong women, um, like my mom who came here with nothing and she put herself through school to become a teacher. Uh, you know, those are the stories that have really stayed with me. Um, as far as my writing life and my writing journey, um, I, there are so many Asian American authors that I love. And actually I pulled a few books that might be of interest to some of you if you like my books. Um, you know, one thing I will say is that the Filipino American lens is endless. You know, my lens, the stories I write in my life that I draw from is just one little way of looking at my culture. There, there are so many wonderful writers out there writing all kinds of stories set in the Philippines or with Filipino characters. And um, this is one I loved. This is by a friend of mine, um, Marie, uh, Marie Cruz, Everlasting Nora. And, you know, talk about empathy. The, the, the easiest way to build empathy, I think, is to read a book. You know, there's no other easy way to just step into somebody else's shoes. Um, it, it's so easy to go to the library and pick up a book and learn about somebody else's world or somebody else's um, journey. And so this is all about a girl who lives in the slums of a Manila cemetery, which is a very real subculture in the Philippines. And um, you know, it, it ends very hopeful, but it's also a very heart-wrenching story of this girl's life living um, in a, sh a Manila shanty town. Um, so she's a Filipino author, American author, who is doing some wonderful things. I would check her out. Um, this is a, a an author illustrator I just learned of, um, but I picked this up because the boy on this book looks like my son who skateboards. And he's an artist um, with with uh well he used to work for disney actually my husband was used to be an artist for disney so we sort of know a little bit about that world but he and he's worked for other like animated films but he's got these wonderful illustrations he's a filipino american ar artist and author um this is you know a science fiction adventure fantasy called timeless um armand baltazar and and i love this book i could just spend hours looking at his beautiful illustrations um, you know, so there's definitely, and I'm going to add this to my list. I'm going to send you a list of other Filipino American authors or stories set around the Philippines that you might check out. But the, you know, people in my field who share a similar background, um, they inspire me because we're all trying to do the same thing, get our voices out there and, and provide windows and mirrors into, um, what we know as, as our culture. Yeah. I, don't I mean, know there's so much, there's, <laughs> There's so much power in and sort of um, reading about stories of of you know maybe someone who's not necessarily the same culture as you, but it gives you like you said that window that door into someone else's sort of life experience. Um, and I think that's 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 what drew me to reading as a young child is just being able to experience other people's lives through through books, and it's it's eye opening. It's absolutely eye opening. So that's very exciting. Um, do we have any other questions from um, from the audience here tonight? If you want, um, if you want to raise your hand, we we'll, might take one more question, um, and then um, 
just have a couple of uh, last few things that we wanted to do before we uh, close up for the night. I don't see any other questions. Um, so what um, I know Mrs. Avalon wanted had some um, some uh, some words that she wanted to share, and then we have a raffle for those um, we those people who signed up ahead of time. We um, uh, we picked two names, and I will announce those as soon as Mrs. Avalon is uh, uh, has a moment to share. Hi, May. I wanted to take this time to thank you to be part of our Napa Valley Unified Author Book Chat. It's it's such an incredible opportunity to meet you. I know people in the audience feel the same way. And um, like you shared, there were very few authors or stories that resembled our Filipino culture. So I wanna thank you for being a trailblazer. Thank you for trailblazing and sharing the rich and the many, many stories that the Philippines brings to our children here and abroad. Uh, thank you for inspiring the young people listening right now, how writing and art and creativity um, can bring forth um, a career path for all of them. I know we have so many stories to tell in our young authors. And I wanted to say thank you again for validating the good work of our teachers, because I, I know our teachers in the audience are saying, yes, you have to edit and feedback is important. And um, finally, thank you for teaching us more about Filipino culture. I appreciate you and I thank you. And if there are any Donald's Way students in the audience, I see you, be sure to remind your teacher that you participated this evening and I'll follow up with all of you with a personal email from your principal. Thank you so much, May. And thank you, Pat, for letting me be part of this um, special event. I, thank you. I appreciate you being here tonight, Marilyn and, and May as well. And I'm going to go ahead and announce what our two winners of uh, signed uh, books from uh, Ms. Respicio. And so we have uh, Santiago Salas, um, who's a student in Napa Valley, because I could tell by the, the email address. So congratulations, Santiago. And also uh, Maria Vasquez. Um, so uh, I have your email addresses and so I will be emailing you and uh, uh, connecting so that we can get information to send you um, the two uh, books of any day, a, two, a copy of, of any day now that'll be um, signed by Ms. Respicio. Um, and just so great. Yeah, um, I feel like we are so fortunate, pardon me? Oh, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I feel like we are so fortunate in Napa Valley Unified to be able to invite such a, a, a wonderful, you know, enthusiastic and um, author to share your story. And I don't know if you have any closing words before uh, we sign off. You know, really that I, I'm just so grateful to be here and to connect with you all. I mean, especially during these strange times, it's, you know, this sort of connection, especially around books and words is so meaningful to me and very inspiring to me. And the only thing I would add is that, you know, for um, you educators, teachers, or parents whose um, you know kids maybe have more questions, I'm always very reachable by my website. You know, email me anytime. I've got a contact thing there. If you have questions about the activities guide or or anything, um, I'm happy to answer questions through my website and through a grown up. So yeah, and I'm very grateful. And and I thank all of you. Thank you for being here. And we actually have one more person who raised their hand, so we can take. We have time okay. to take this one uh, last question. Uh, Hilda, um, uh, Hilda, do you have a question for Miss um, Respicio? Where can I buy her books? Uh, her where can her books are available at both Bookmine in Napa as well as Copperfield in Napa. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> And I see Rodolfo keeps, I think, trying to, to, to raise his hand, but I don't know if there's a, a is having a glitch with his, uh, so we'll have to, if you have questions, please feel free to email me and I'll get them to Miss um, Respicio. Um, so thank you all again for joining us tonight. Um, I have loved hearing about the writing process and, and how you go about developing these absolutely wonderful stories. Um, about students who um, reflect some of the students in our in our school community. And uh, it's just really uh, touching um, and I think important work. So thank you so much. And thank you, uh, Ms. Avalon for joining us this evening. Um, our wonderful interpreter, uh, Mrs. Uh, Val, Val, I keep wanting to, I, 
um, Mrs. Valdivioso, and then of course, Mr. Ruiz, who's always here uh, hosting and running the webinars to make sure they go very smoothly. So thank you to everyone tonight. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, I look forward to our next author um, who will be here in December. Um, it's Juana Martinez, who's uh, the writer and illustrator of, uh, or, of Fry Bread. I wanna say she's the illustrator of Fry Bread, um, but she's also uh, written several other books. So she'll be here in uh, December. So thank you so much. Everyone have a great evening. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you. Good night.